lumbar vertebrae, both typical as well as atypical. Sorry guys, but somehow I completely forgot that I still owe you part about lumbar vertebrae and one of the subscribers to my channel actually reminded me recently about needs to put this. So what we have here on the right side of the screen are three lumbar vertebrae connected to each other and on the left side of the screen I still have two lower thoracic vertebrae just for comparative purposes. The thoracic vertebrae, the lower thoracic of course, started showing already trend to become a little bit closer and to gradually change towards features of lumbar vertebrae. So one of the things that we notice here is first shortening of the spinous processes and also their gradual tendency to become a little bit more rectangular as it could be seen on the lower thoracic vertebra still in my hand. Additional important features that we were able to see on the thoracic vertebrae was position and orientation of their articular processes and facets. So as we can see here, this is paired superior articular processes and orientation of facets which is practically straight backwards facing into a camera. Due to this arrangement of articular processes of thoracic vertebrae, they are capable of producing a bit of rotational movement between themselves and of also a little bit of flexion and extension which certainly becomes controlled with the position of ribs making thoracic cage a little bit stiffer than any other part of the spine. For the orientation of inferior articular processes as they could be seen here and here Practically they are again facing into cameras so we know that thoracic vertebrae will have their articular processes oriented in forward backward direction practically sitting nearly in the frontal plane. So let's take a look now at the lumbar vertebrae and let's find out what makes them unique. As the in front of us are three lumbar vertebrae, doesn't matter whether they are L1, L2, L3 or L3, 4 and 5 essentially it's very difficult to see any difference unless you have all five of them and you can only recognize them on the basis of their slightly increased size as we go further to lower parts of the spinal column. So let me remove first one of these lumbar vertebrae and let's take a look at its features. This is the upper lumbar vertebra, perhaps L1 or L2, but we already have enough to be able to see. The spinous process became short, horizontal and rectangular. The body of a vertebra is also quite massive compared to thoracic and it's also quite thick again comparing it to thoracic vertebrae. Superior articular processes are already showing here a tendency to have their facets facing into each other so being oriented medially that is happening of course on the superior articular processes whereas the inferior articular process has the facet which is oriented laterally. Due to massive and sometimes pretty intense overlocking pattern that lumbar vertebrae produce when they are put together, this explains why is it not possible to expect lumbar vertebrae to produce any form of rotational movement. However, they are perfectly capable of producing flexion and extension and also due to slight discrepancy in size and the position of articular processes, lumbar vertebrae will be able to produce also lateral flexion or side bending of the spine. Finally, here is the lumbar vertebra by itself and let's find some of these features that really make it unique for lumbar vertebrae only. All the different parts of the vertebra that were illustrated earlier could be found and identified from body to pedicles to transfers or costal processes, superior articular processes, spinous process, inferior articular processes and their facets including superior and inferior vertebral notches. So the question is then what makes lumbar vertebrae unique as the group? We already addressed the idea of their facets turning inwards so practically oriented medially 
and laterally for the inferior articular processes. But from the above, we can see something that no other group of vertebrae exhibited so far. Lumbar vertebrae would have two different paired processes and first the big rounded projection that we see here being part of the superior articular process. That is called the mammillary process. Mama in Latin means breast and it does have a bit of shape of a breast. It is quite large and the result of this mammillary process in its development is that the different muscles that have to act directly on the lumbar vertebrae do not have a great position, either they have amazing leverage. So practically in order to induce the movement of lumbar vertebrae, they really have to pull quite hard in order to make this movement happen. So because the bone is simply responding to this kind of stress, those large mammillary processes become formed during the lifetime. Additional projections that are not as visible as the mammillary processes could be seen here towards the base of the transverse or costal process. This is what is called the accessory process. Sometimes it is much easier to feel it through palpation and to get the exact ideas how large or how small they are rather than to try to see it. I think that camera here is a good position which can nicely point out to accessory process on the left side of this lumbar vertebra. Finally, one has to answer a question like, out of five lumbar vertebrae, is there anyone which is considered to be atypical? To answer that question with yes or no is a little bit difficult, so it might be a bit better to say that all five vertebrae in a lumbar group really look very close to, to each other. Perhaps the only exception is vertebra L5. This may not be the best example because it's quite difficult to see it, but L5 vertebra has somewhat of a wedge-shaped body, which means anteriorly it is a little bit thicker compared to the same measurement at the back of the body of L5 vertebra. Reason for that is going to be explained in the next sequence of this video where I will try to put the sacrum next to lumbar vertebra L5 to practically demonstrate why is this feature interesting and important for us. The sacrum which I have available unfortunately does not belong to the same skeleton so there will be a slight discrepancy in the size of L5 vertebra versus sacrum but regardless of that I think that I can successfully demonstrate what is going on. Lumbar vertebrae as we know are producing lumbar lordosis, a curvature which is concave posteriorly which needs to quickly change to sacral and coccygeal kyphosis where the curvature exhibits concavity oriented forward. So when we place together the sacrum and L5 vertebra, assuming that they would be coming from the same specimen, this is happening at the connection between sacrum and L5 vertebra. The gap which exists between bodies of L5 and the first sacral segment is quite wide and it has to be compensated also with an intervertebral disc that is also very thick anteriorly but posteriorly it becomes a little bit thinner. So this disc becomes some kind of intermediary uh, structure that really compensates in a transition between lumbar lower doses versus sacral kyphosis. On a specimen where the discs will be preserved it would be much easier to demonstrate but essentially this angle which is generated between L5 vertebra and sacrum is what is called the lumbosacral promontory. So I'm just placing my left hand, my index finger and my thumb to try to mock this angle a little bit more against the dark background so one can see really like where the tip of this angle would be found. So that is the lumbosacral promontory and for that stuff wedge shaped body of L5 as well as the different shaped disc between L5 vertebrae and sacrum are going to be of great responsibility to make it happen.